The opening bell is going to ring in less than one minute, folks. Let's put all of this in perspective. One thing you're going to hear a lot today is that bear markets have sharp rallies to the upside. Once that, that will be frozen into your brain. In the last eight rallies, there have been 120 rallies or big days up 2.5% or more. I guess the conclusion there is that don't buy into these rallies. Don't believe in these rallies. The one thing no one's probably going to tell you, though, historically, this has happened 100% of the time, believe it or not that after every single bear market we've ever had in the history of America, we eventually went back to an all-time high. Not saying it's going to happen today, obviously, but remember that, folks, as you're thinking about making poor decisions. Okay, we got 10 seconds left. All eyes are on this market, particularly the tech names, which sort of led the way yesterday. Consumer discretionary, one of the stronger sectors, led by a whole lot of brick-and-mortar names. Let's see what they can do also today. Hearing it now, opening bell. As we populate the board, you'll see the winners and the losers. Automatically, United Technologies, Caterpillar to the downside. Uh, we've got one winner, ironically, Verizon with that beef, <laughs> with the beef with Disney. And Disney now in the number one position. So they're jugg juggling back and forth. But down 291, this is less than anticipated an hour ago, even 20 minutes ago. It's going to be another wild ride. Let the market find its footing here. Generally, in these kind of settings, uh, most professional investors don't even make any kind of trades until at least 10 o'clock. And even then, these days, you still want to wait. All 30 Dow stocks are on the downside. Take a look at the S&P 500 off 1.4% right now, 33 points. And then there's NASDAQ, 360-point gain yesterday, a monster gain, uh, given back one-third of that at the open. We'll keep an eye on these big tech names. In fact, let's look at the, uh, the biggest names uh, that have powered this market for a couple of years, up and now been powering this market to the downside. Alphabet, Google, your biggest loser percentage-wise there. Then there's oil, oil off 1.5%. Supplies globally, just a massive, massive glut building. Ironically, we turned on nine more rigs last week. I'm not sure why. Joining us now, Scott Martin, David Bonson, Christina parts All right, David, I want to start with you. Record percentage move yesterday. Uh, what does it say to you about this market? Where do you think we go near term and long term? Record record point move yesterday, right. you mean. And yeah, it... it um, it was a great example as to why people could not be trying to trade in and out of this thing because you miss a day like yesterday, you potentially miss like a third of the recovery, right? I mean, it's just too important that people sit still, not overreact, and not try to trade out and come back later. I mean, 1,100 points in a day. Can you imagine someone who decided to go to cash right before that and thinks they're coming back in in a few days? This volatility is going to continue. There's no reason for the market to find any footing right now. Half of Wall Street's not even working. Um, we're going to get into January, and we're going to see if fundamentals can take back over from fear. Uh, Scott, your thoughts? I don't totally agree with that. I mean, I get the premise that you're right. You know, David's right. You can't pick the bottoms on Monday and then get the tops on Tuesday. That's true. Or Wednesday or whatever it was after the holiday. But look, the reality is there are things you can do, though, because he's right. You know, volatility is definitely back. Uh, the market psychology is definitely poor. And for us, as you know, Charles, we've been talking about this, you know, for the last few days and weeks is that there's things like fixed income that are working. There's things like utilities that are working. Gold's working. So, to mitigate the volatility, I guess you don't necessarily have to trade in and out, but you can take off some of those positions that maybe are seeing bounces on days like yesterday and get into stuff that's actually working like gold, as I mentioned. What about cash, though, Scott? Yeah, absolutely. Cash is another place to do that because, Charles, as, as mentioned, you know, the volatility is going to keep going here into the end of the year and likely into January as we get into earnings season. So stuff that gets thrown out with the baby, the bathtub and the bathwater, that's what you should have your cash for. Wait, to, to many comments. First, gold is seeing, what, a five-month high, but could potentially have a, a much bigger upswing. Usually, that's the case when we see the markets plummet so much as we did on Monday. I'm hearing some people say that this is a sucker's rally, and that was yesterday, the fact that everybody bought in thinking that they could ride this hide. And when I, I was on the New York Stock Exchange floor most of yesterday during the day, and I went up to traders and asked them, what do you think's the catalyst for all, all this? Is it the retail sales? Is it the fact that Jay Powell's position is 100% confirmed and not going anywhere. And most of them had no idea, no idea. And it was mostly just due to headlines and lower volatility and uh, lower volume. Well, that that, so that sounds like this uh, no idea as the same answer they had as to why things were dropping 600 points a day 
previously. Exactly. I mean, the fact of the matter is that the, the up and down volatility, what we know is not answerable in a three day period of time. Precisely. Over three months, six months, we have the trade war. We have the Federal Reserve. And I would argue it's not about interest rates with the Federal Reserve. It's about the balance sheet and their continued insistence on extracting liquidity from the economy. If all of a sudden you get a Fed that starts to down talk their balance sheet reduction in 2019, it becomes a very fundamental reason for markets to rally. I don't agree at all about gold, by the way, being a place to go trade into during this. Gold does not have a reverse correlation with equity markets. Yeah. historically. Well, it has a non-correlation no, yes it does. with well, equity now it does. markets. Well, you know, listen. Right I mean, now, over the last two weeks, <laughs> over the last two weeks it has, gold two is months. sitting here look, down look at the 40, bottom in October. 40% over seven years. Gold is down 40% over seven years. Well, the market's up, one, so there though, is a negative right? correlation. I mean, the, the idea, though, that you would sell, you know, for the average investor out there, not a professional trader, to kind of sell a, a core holding uh, and, to, and then to buy gold and then somehow get out of it in the right time and get back in those core holdings. I think that's the quandary people are in. I know someone who sold yesterday Netflix at the open, and then he uh, came to my office and said, did I make a mistake uh, at 1 o'clock? So people are grappling with what to do and making a lot of panicky moves here. Uh, you know, of course, White House ec ec economist Kevin Hassett, it, it, you know, he tried to soothe that all out. Uh, he mentioned that the Fed chair Powell's here to stay for good. Uh, and, David, the markets did react to that. Uh, you know, that is one of the reasons the market rallied yesterday. There's no doubt about it. No one wants to see more instability. Certainly no one likes the, uh, the open war between the White House and the Federal Reserve, although I think the White House, David, uh, makes good points about the, uh, the, not only the rate hikes, but to your point also taking $50 billion a, a month of a combination out, uh, not knowing where it's going to go, could be a mistake. Yeah, I think I think we have to kind of separate why the market might have responded about Chairman Powell being on stronger footing and what Kevin Hassett said yesterday from the actions of the Fed itself. In other words, I don't think the market is saying we approve of everything the Fed's doing. The market clearly would love for the Fed to go hyper dovish. We understand that it doesn't make the market right about it. Ultimately, I think the market, though, does not want to believe that there's more sort of instability and more maybe, uh, shall we say, poor behavior or poor choices coming from the president. I mean, he didn't say this, and so I think he was falsely accused of it. But if the markets believe that President Trump was going down this path of trying to fire the Federal Reserve president, the Federal Reserve right. chairman, it but would Scott, not have been good. Scott, David just made the point. President Trump never said that. He has voiced, uh, yeah. you know, disappointment with Fed policy. Uh, and, and listen, I think he has a right to be disappointed. Uh, I agree. And I think Jay Powell's got something going for him because I believe he's about 5'10 or 5'11. So his height thing is not going to come into play here like it did maybe with Janet Yellen. Uh, kidding aside, though, Charles, I think uh, Fed Chairman Powell got the kiss of death. The 100 uh, percent confidence that his job is safe means he's out of there in six months. <laughs> All right. Well, let's talk about the uh, since we're on politics here a little bit, the shutdown. Scott, uh, listen, I don't think the shutdown will, will have any impact on the markets. And I don't think it impacts fundamentals. Certainly not in the long term. Nevertheless, it's a great headline for headline writers to talk about and to use as a pylon uh, mechanism like everything else out there. So what do you think? Where, what is the, where does this shutdown play with respect to the way you're investing? I agree. The media has loved it, Charles. They've run with it for days now. And as it goes on, it continues to be a lead story. Uh, David's right, though. You know, this again goes into that bucket of kind of questionable behavior, questionable behavior, maybe uncertainty and things that just mess with the market. So look at Charles, I think that the shutdown is wearing off. However, you know, we've had these before. We've had dozens of them in the past. And here's the, the story, kids. Every time, guess what's happened? Or most of the time, all the time, as Yogi Berra would say, Treasuries have rallied, and we've seen that again, where Treasury prices have gone up as the government has shut down, and I don't think this time is any different. Uh, David, uh, real quick, do you got any thoughts on this shutdown? Well, I completely agree. It's a total non-market event. I'm not particularly convinced that anyone in the country, investors or non-investors, cares if they don't work in the Beltway or for certain leftist news networks. Um, I am not talking to anybody who's bringing up the shutdown of all the issues going on with the market right now, all the volatility, everything we're doing, positioning client portfolios going into 2019 around our corporate right. profit expectations, around what Trump's going to do with this trade war, 
all of these things, the last thing on our list would be government shutdown. So I completely agree. It's a non-event for investors. Guys, let me just shift gears here for a moment. I'm looking and it looks like uh, this, uh, this yield, uh, yield uh, curve situation. Uh, are we at 275? Did we hit them for both? 275, 10-year, 275, 2-year, uh, the, the dreaded inverted yield curve. Uh, potentially signaling a recession in a year from now, year and a half from now. Uh, does this change anything for you, Scott? Because this is something Wall Street was saying that they were worried about starting back way back in February. No, not at the moment. I mean, other than the fact that it's it's concerning. I mean, it's concerning to as as, as talked about already on the segment here about how the Fed is 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 still reducing their balance sheet. They're still hawkish. Uh, they just raised interest rates. Oh, what about a week ago now? So the the market is telling us something, and maybe it's just that hey, things are softening, and the Fed needs to pause, which I do think they're going to do in Q1. I'm just not sure if it's going to be too late. David, uh, you know the the Fed speakers come out all the time. Uh, they never stop talking ever, uh, you know, on any given day, up to four of them may be speaking somewhere. Should they take this opportunity very soon to make it uh, clear to all investors on, a, on, on the no one's, no one's nothing uh, uh, unequivocally that they understand they got the message and uh, they will find a way not to destroy this economy? Yeah, I have actually two answers to that, though, Charles. They do need to do it. I think that even the White House probably needs to issue something. I have a lot of confidence in my dear friend Larry Kudlow to get out in front of this, to help the president with the messaging of what they want to do for an economic growth message in 2019. Um, however, on the Fed's messaging, they also cannot look as if they're capitulating to the stock market and letting the stock market drive them. I look back 20 years ago, one of the worst moves in Federal Reserve history when Alan Greenspan cut rates in a screaming good economy just because we had had that one setback in the fall of 98. And I don't and I believe it set a precedent. We started calling it the Greenspan put, as yeah, you know. Yeah. And I'll tell you, I don't think the Fed can afford to get rid of credit credibility either. They can let their actions do the talking. Slow down on this balance sheet reduction. Um, as and far what? as the yield curve inversion, though, I'm not sure if it is actually inverted or not. Right. I'm sitting here talking to you. But um, I'll tell you, we, uh, it is not a timing predictor. I mean, the length no, of not. time I, by just, which it's a yield curve thing, inversion... It's, it, the thing is, it just became a big deal on Wall Street. Scott, Dave, uh, thank you guys both very, very much. 